There is a quiet place. Brother Carlo, I don't know where you went to, but that was... Thank you, brother. The Lord's played through you. Wasn't that beautiful? Wow. I'm looking forward to when we're in that eternal quiet place in heaven, right? And we get to hear the heavenly choir singing and the instruments of heaven playing. And then we're in church on that Sabbath morning, and guess who stands up to speak? Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? And we hear for the first time for our ears, the King of the universe, who died for me, standing up to deliver the word on that Sabbath morning. I can't wait for heaven. I don't know about you. I, wanna, I want to go home, and I want to see Jesus. And I can't wait to hear how he tells me the story of him saving me from my life of being completely destroyed. And he says, you know, Phil, you were headed down this direction, and I came, I, I, I came and through the Holy Spirit and the angels. It was hard because you were really hard-headed, but I started turning you towards me. And then he tells me how he moved in my life and broke the sin out of me and transformed me. What, a, what an incredible testimony that's going to be. And it's not just going to be that here's that story. Every one of you here, by God's grace, is going to hear that story too. What do you say? Well, it's good to see you all here this morning. Happy Sabbath to each of you. I tell you, Lindsay and I have enjoyed thoroughly our first week here. It has been a full week of ministry that we've been watching this church do. And I praise God for an active church. What do you say? We've had a board meeting Monday night. We had health ministries Tuesday night. That was really good food, by the way. They'd had a great presentation, good food, and a a powerful talk afterwards combining spirituality with health. If you haven't gone to a health ministries meeting, you got to go. And then Wednesday night, we had the Pathfinders, and then prayer meeting, Pastor Gibbs gave an excellent overview. We started into Revelation chapter 1. And it got so deep, I think we only made it through the first five or six verses, if I remember correctly. But it was really powerful. And then um, last night, the school program listening to the, or not last night, Thursday night, excuse me. The school program listening to the kids. Praise God for this church. What God is doing. Well, our message this morning is going to be coming out of Exodus chapter 17. Before we pray, I'd like you to turn there with me, if you would, in your Bibles. Right there at the beginning, Exodus chapter 17. And we're going to be studying through this passage. The topic for this morning is the God in your storm. I believe the deacons have a handout that they're going to be passing out, if you would like to do that at this time. And uh, while they're passing that out, we'll uh, actually, we'll have prayer and then you all can begin passing it out. But thank you for, for being willing to do that. I appreciate your ministry in this church. Let's Bow our heads for prayer as we begin. O gracious Father, I am thankful that we get to come before you this morning, that we can pray in your presence. Father, as we're about to open your word, I need a fresh dispensation of your spirit to anoint my mind and speak through my mouth. The greatest danger we have this morning is that I'll be seen and not Jesus. And so we ask together here that Christ will be lifted up before us, that his message will be heard and felt, and that we will leave here transformed by your spirit because we've been in your presence. We lay this time in your hands and we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen, for passing those out. Exodus chapter 17. A story by way of introduction. The year is 1396 A.D. Thank you, Brother Alex. Europe has been going through what's been called the Dark Ages. There has been a steady decline from the height of the Roman Empire. There's been a steady decline in the nation or in the continent of Europe from sophistication, wealth, and luxury. There's been a steady decline. Disease has begun to become rampant. It's had its its hold on the people. Food has become more and more scarce. 
grinding poverty, the vast majority of the population has been experiencing grinding poverty. Only a few are doing well, the very wealthy. And even by today's standards, the wealthy, we wouldn't consider living that great except they had lots of servants. The year is 1396. Not far from, in Europe, there, not only has there been a, a decline in the a decline in the physical and the wealth of Europe, but there has been a massive spiritual decline that has been gripping the continent of Europe. The gospel, which had been given sometime earlier in, in the beginnings of the, the early Christian church with Christ first and the disciples that had blown across the world with incredible power. That gospel was now been perverted and mostly lost. Instead of a free gift of salvation, people thought they had to buy their salvation to earn their place in, in God's kingdom. They were beating them. Priests and, and monks would beat themselves mercilessly trying to atone for the sins that they had committed. Sin was becoming widespread. And people were beginning to wonder if anything was going to stop the tide of corruption and misery that was sweeping across Europe. The year is 1369. I misspoke earlier. And in a little town called Hysinic in the country of then Bohemia, a child by the name of Jan Hus was born. It wasn't marked by very many people, but Jan Hus was to go on to begin to be a great reformer for the Lord. It was a poor family that he was born into, but it was quickly seen that Hus had an incredible mind and a deep passion for knowing the Bible and the God of the Bible. Through sacrifice of his family, he was sent to, to get a greater education, and he became very successful in school. He was the top of his class, and by the age of 31, he was the rector of the university of his school of Prague, the University of Prague. And then, not long after that, he was installed as the pastor of the Bethlehem Chapel. Well, we were in Europe. We got to visit where Hus would preach. His sermons were incredibly powerful because unlike most of the sermons that people heard, Huss brought people the fresh living word of God every single week. And when people hear the word, their lives are changed. What do you say? This little tiny chapel, I was actually really surprised at how small it was in comparison to the numbers of people that would pack in. Thousands of people would pack in every single Sunday to hear the word of God preached. And they didn't have pews like we have here this morning. They stood and listened to him preach, sometimes for over an hour, pressed together, very little room around them because everyone wanted to hear the word of God presented before the people. His messages were powerful and they were life-changing. And the city of Prague became a completely different city. The Reformation was beginning. God was beginning to shine light into the darkness. We skip forward in our story because the point of the story is coming very quickly. Not long after he was installed, in fact, just a few years after he was installed, he got a letter from Rome demanding that he come and stand trial for the heretical doctrines he was teaching that someone could be saved by Jesus Christ alone. He knew that to go would mean instant death, so he refused. So not long after that, they sent another letter and they said, come and meet in Constance and we'll there have a dialogue to understand what is right and wrong. So he goes in 1414 to Constance to stand trial for teaching the word of God. Church, we have great freedoms today because of men like him and women like him who stood by faith on the word of God. Praise God for the country we have today. He stands there. He goes there, and he had been promised a safe conduct. Emperor Charles had promised him that he would be able to be there safe. And, but not long after he got there, about three or four weeks after he arrived, he was arrested in the middle of the night and thrown on November 11 into a filthy, dark, damp dungeon. 
and he was left to rot in that place for seven long months. It was freezing cold. The chains, they would make sure they were extra tight around his wrists. They rubbed into his wrists. He had sores. He became gaunt and emaciated. Finally, seven months after he had been thrown into the dungeon against the promise of the same conduct that he had been given, they dragged him before the council. Picture the scene in your mind. Here's the king sitting on his throne. He's covered in the wealth and rank of his title. He's surrounded by the courtiers, and then around him are the lords and the the other rulers in the kingdom. And shuffling in to the auditorium is Jan Hus. He's a skeleton. His hands and his feet are bound with shackles. He's shuffling because not only has he been starving, but he's sick and he's cold. He's a shell of the man that had walked in seven months earlier. And he stands there before the council to make a defense for his faith. I want to pause our story and ask a question. On the one hand, you see Jan Ha. On the other, you see the wealth of the kingdom and of the church. And if you were to have dropped in without knowing any background and look between these two men and were to have been asked the question, who is blessed in this room, who would you have said is blessed of God between these two people? Who would you have said, oh, well, that's the blessed person, and that person must be suffering under the curse of God? Who would you have said is the one that it, God is on their side? If I hadn't have given you the background, I'm guessing many of us would have said, well, it seems to be kind of obvious to my human eyes, not talking spiritually, but talking humanly. It appears that the king is the one who is blessed, and God must be on his side. Are you with me? And the man standing here emaciated, cold, sick, dying, that must be the person that God's not on his side. It's much easier to trust God when all is well in our lives. We'll come back to our story here a little bit later in the sermon. But I want to stop on this point because it's one that I think many of us struggle with. It's a lot easier to trust God when everything's going well. It's another thing entirely when the world or our lives seem to be falling apart. And then it is that God says, trust me, I've got my hand in your life. When our finances are good, then it is that we say, you know, God is so good. He has blessed me so much, right? But then when, when our Maybe our, de- our, our mortgage is, we're behind on our mortgage, or maybe our finances are, are in shambles, or, or maybe our family is falling apart. Is God still good in the middle of that? Is He your loving God, not only when you're healthy, but also when you're diagnosed with cancer and you've been given just months to live? Is He your loving God when you find out that there's a loved one that's passed away sooner than you expected? And anyone that we love, it's never time for them to go. Are you with me? Our story this morning is in Exodus chapter 17. A people that are facing a crisis that they don't know how to handle because God is not interacting in their lives in the way that they expected Him to interact. Let's start in verse 1. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel sat out, sat, set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Now this is a problem. They're crossing a desert. If you don't have water... What ultimately happens to you? You'll what? You're going to die. You have to have water to be able to live. 
Think of the background to this. They had been slaves just not that long prior. God had done some incredible things to set them free. He had dropped the ten plagues on the Egyptians. And the Egyptians had finally said, please get out of here. We, we understand that your God is more powerful. And then when the Egyptians tried to come back and reconquer them, God split the Red Sea in two and they walked across on dry ground. When they ran out of food, God had sent them manna to provide food for them. Now, it had been after they complained, but God did send manna. What do you say? And as they see this, they see a God who is the deliverer. A God who is the what? The deliverer. He's powerful. He's mighty. He's loving. He's a protector and he is the provider. He does everything that they need. But then this happens. They find themselves without water. This isn't the God that they know. This is, that God is supposed to be protecting them and providing them. As they look at their children wasting away for lack of water, as, as that mother has the tugging of the child, and saying, Mommy, I'm thirsty, I need some water. I'm guessing the question began to come pounding into their minds, and we find it later in the verses, is God really with us right now? It was easy to know that God was there or the Red Sea was divided. But now the question is, is God still with me when my children are needing water? And you know, sometimes we look back and we judge them. But I think those same questions are ones that we wrestle with as well. If you were dying of thirst on a journey that God had sent you to take, would you be wondering if God was really guiding you at that point or not? Thus, the children of Israel began to question God's presence because he was not fitting into their preconceived ideas of who and what God should be. Forgetting that God is not a man and that his judgments are unsearchables and his ways past finding out, they make their way to Moses with a demand for water. Pick up the story again in verses 2 and 3, and then we'll go to our handout. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And so Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it that you've brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Point number one, if you're taking, pull out your hand out, I want you to notice that a point number one comes out of what we just read. You can fill in the blanks there. Hopefully, if you need a pen, someone beside you has one, or there's one in front of you in the pews. Point number one is this. We often struggle. We often what? Struggle to follow and trust God. Because he doesn't do what we expect him to do. I'm going to read that again. We often struggle to follow and trust. And what's the word? Trust. Who? God. Because he doesn't do what we, what's the word? Expect him to do. I, I've heard it sometimes, and, and honestly, church, I've, I'm in the same boat of sometimes doing this as well. You know, maybe, maybe you've heard it like this. God is too loving to want me to lose my job by not working on Sabbath. I have this perspective of God, and God wouldn't want me to lose my job. Or, or maybe it goes like this, God is too caring to ask me to pay my tithe rather than pay all of my bills. Instead of remembering that it's his money, and, and he's responsible for taking care of me, right? Or maybe someone says, God is too compassionate to want me to give up this treasured thing that I love. And so, I'm not going to give it up. And the crisis comes when the Word of God says one thing, and, and what we are experiencing, or, or what, what I want to do, is something completely different. And then we have the crisis, because 
Are we going to accept the God we've created in our mind? Or are we going to accept the God as revealed in His Word? What do we want, church family? The Word. And then we have the choice. Or maybe we're going through an experience in our lives, uh, a heartache of some, maybe a losing a family member, or maybe it's, it's, it's trouble in our marriage, or, or maybe it's something going on in our home. And as we face that crisis, we have a question, is this really God working with me through this? And we put God in a box of what we want instead of trusting that He knows best for my life. And I know it's not easy. I know it's not easy. But if we trust God, He will do exactly what we need. <clears throat> Isaiah 55 and verse 8, Prophet Isaiah says, My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. You see, God has an incredible problem that only His divine power can do. Just like the children of Israel were coming out of slavery, so we, as God's people, are also being led by Him out of slavery. Take your Bibles and go with me to Romans chapter 6 and verse 17. I've really been enjoying the Sabbath school lesson that we've had over this quarter, studying through the book of Romans. I love the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 17, turn there with me if you would very quickly. Romans chapter 6 and verse 17, the Apostle Paul lays out very clearly that every single one of us here are on a very similar journey that the children of Israel were. We are coming out of slavery into the freedom that God promises. Are you there in Romans chapter 6 and verse 17? Praise God. Notice what it says. But God be thanked, Romans chapter 6 and verse 17, that though you were, what's the word? Slaves of what? Sin. Though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. We were, what's the word? Slaves. And then we are, that's right, brother, we were delivered by the grace of Jesus Christ. But see, the process of deliverance is God not only setting us free, but then through the power of His Spirit, transforming us into brand new to people that reflect the character of Jesus Christ. And church, that transformation is the work of a lifetime. It's, the big word is sanctification. But it's a process of God whittling away the brokenness the sin, the evil that is in my heart until I perfectly reflect Jesus. And he does that by bringing me into circumstances that I don't understand. But if I trust him, will recreate inside of me the character of Jesus. What a gracious God we have. How much he loves me. He doesn't give me what I want. He gives me what I need. Now that's a loving God. An indulgent God would give me what I want. A loving God gives me what, if I could see the end from the beginning, would be, this is what I need. Thank you, God, for giving that to me. In fact, Christ, our example, went through this same thing. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10. This verse is electrifying. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10. Just a little bit farther there in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10. This verse shows us the example of Christ in that he was perfected by the same means that God wants to take us. Are you there in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10? Notice what it says. I hear some pages turning. Take your time. Get there. I want you to see this from your Bible. It's so powerful. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10. Are you there? Notice what it says. For it was fitting for him. For whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make, to make the captain of their salvation. Who's the captain of our salvation, church? It's Jesus Christ. So this is talking about Jesus. Now notice the next phrase. To make the captain of their salvation, read it with me if you're in the New King James, perfect through suffering. How are they, how is Christ, 
who was perfect, made perfect. He was made perfect through, what does Paul say? Suffering. Now, I don't understand how that works. But Jesus, our example, was made the perfect sacrifice through suffering. And God does the exact same thing with his people today. Restoring the damage of sin is not easy. Thus, God takes his people through the very things needed to grow his character inside of them so that they reflect him perfectly. Praise God. Point number two. Go back with me to Exodus chapter 17. So the first thing we need to realize is we mustn't put God into a box and become frustrated when he doesn't do what we want but instead trust that he's doing what is best because he loves us. Point number two. Exodus chapter 17. You can write down in your notes there. Point number two is he is the God in our storm. If you go to Exodus chapter 17 and verse 4, let's read that verse there very quickly. The children of Israel have come. They've been complaining to Moses. They're threatening to stone him. They're dying, they think, of thirst. None of them were actually dying of thirst, but they feel like they're dying of thirst. They're looking towards the future. They're worried about it. Verse 4, so Moses cried out to who? The Lord. Exodus 17 and verse 4, saying, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. Moses cries out to God, I don't want you to miss this. We have a God who isn't just doing what's best for us, but he is there with us while he carries us through it. The cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night was in the middle of the camp of Israel, Showing them that every step they were taking, Jesus was there with them, never to leave them nor forsake them. And what I love about God is as he's perfecting the character of Jesus Christ inside of us, he doesn't just start it and walk away. He stands there holding his arm around us, sometimes carrying us through it, but he is there every single millistep of the way. What do you say? He is the God in your storm. There may be times when you don't feel like he's there, but I stand here on the word of God promising you that he is there. And that if you hold on by faith, he will never let you go. Praise God. The God in our storm. I love Exodus chapter 13, verse 21 and 22. I'll just read it here for you. The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. So as to go by day and night, he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Jesus was always with them. Just the same God who walked with the children of Israel was this also the God who stepped into the fiery furnace with Daniel and his friends. He is also the God who was with the disciples as they took the gospel to the world. And he is the God who promises this morning in Hebrews chapter 13 to never leave you nor forsake you. Praise God. He is our God. He will be with you. He was the God who is with his disciples in the storm and he will be with you in the storm today. And so on the last point as we come to the conclusion, point number three. He is the God in our storm, point number two. Point number three, in your storm. And I should add, if you will trust him, he creates something beautiful. In your storm, he creates something beautiful. We find this in verse 5 of Exodus chapter 17. Hopefully you're still there. Moses has cried out to God and God comes back and responds to him. Notice verse 5. And the Lord said to Moses, go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock of Horeb and you 
shall strike the rock. And what's the word? Water will come out of the rock that the people may drink. God produced a miracle that was very rare. He produced a massive river in the middle of the camp. Before, they had had water in containers. And have you ever gone camping or backpacking and you, you know the water in the containers? It doesn't taste that good, right? It gets old after a few days, at least. I don't really like it. But when you have fresh water, you want to refill your containers, right? God brings something beautiful. Before, they were carrying their water. Now, He gives them fresh water from heaven that I am guessing tastes better than any water you've ever had before. God gave them something beautiful. And in the middle of our trials, God wants to bring something beautiful from the destruction and the misery that Satan is trying to bring in. Satan means it for evil, but God means it for good. And in the middle of our trials, when we're struggling, if we trust Him, God will bring something incredible out of the pain. Praise God. I have to say it again, what a compassionate and loving Father we have. As we trust Him, how good and faithful He is. How patient God is, even when the Israelites were complaining. Even when they were questioning. Even when they were threatening to stone His servant, He still worked on their behalf. Praise God. And the moment we choose to trust Him, He will create something beautiful. I can't create it beautiful, but Jesus can Water from the rock. We don't have time this morning to go and study Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, but I want to encourage you to write it down in your notes and go read it when you go home to this afternoon. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. The Apostle Paul breaks down what happens through tribulation. And I'll just give it to you very briefly. He says, Tribulation produces patience, and patience produces character, and character produces hope that will not disappoint. God sends trials into our lives to produce the character of Jesus Christ so that we will have the hope of eternal life made a reality inside of us and we can go home and spend eternity with Him. God wants to spend eternity with His people and He will do whatever it takes to make sure we can go home. Praise God. And now we return to Prague. We left the scene with the king... And the courtiers on one side and Jan Hus on the other. Wealth, health, and luxury, misery, imprisonment, and a martyr's grave. But our eyes have been opened. Because now we can see that though there was apparent success over here, There is a retinue of angels and even Jesus Christ himself standing here with Jan Hus, encouraging him, supporting him, and bringing something beautiful out of what he's going through. Let me tell you what beautiful thing came from it. Jan Hus was condemned to die. He's taken to the stake. He's tied to the stake. The wood is piled around him, and the flames are lit. As they look up around his body, he begins to sing until finally the flames silent the singing of that godly man, and all that's left is ashes. The people that have killed him murdered him, scoop up the ashes, and they dump them in a river. Those ashes are carried by the river around the world as it empties into the ocean. Jan Hus's death and his dear friend Jerome started the beginnings of a revolution that swept across Europe. People began to realize that something was wrong. And they began to clamor to get access to the Word of God. And from his death and many others, 
the freedoms we enjoy today find their root. And someday in heaven, when Jan Hus is greeted by Christ at the heavenly gates, I want to be there and watch that reunion. Because I can imagine Hus saying, Christ, I know you had a reason I don't understand, but what happened after my death? And Christ begins to trace the millions of people that are in heaven because he was faithful when everything seemed against him. And he's going to step back and say, God, this is so beautiful. I can't believe you entrusted me with, with this. I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know what heartache you have this morning, what challenge you may be facing, or you're going to face this week. But I know that God, if you trust Him, will bring something beyond your wildest dreams, something beautiful from it. As we close, I want to read from a letter that Ellen White wrote to someone in 1896. She says, The Lord permits great trials to come upon His loved ones. He tries them as gold. Now is your opportunity to show that you trust in the Redeemer. Even though in the crucible of affliction, be cheerful, be cheerful and let your cheerfulness be seen in your countenance because you have Jesus by your side. To watch with you. You may converse with Jesus. You may say, the Lord is my helper. I shall not be moved. If you want to join me in saying, Lord, whatever trials I may be in, I will choose however hard it is, to trust you. Would you stand with me as we pray? You're saying, Lord, I'm trusting you in this trial. Stand as we pray. Praise God. Oh, Father in heaven, the trials that we face Satan tries to cause to feel completely overwhelming. They hurt. They're painful. They're discouraging. But we choose to trust through the darkness that you're there with us. To believe that you have a beautiful image that you're creating in our lives that perfectly reflects Jesus. To hold on to the hand that you've extended towards us. To trust in the arms that you've wrapped around us. And by faith to go forward from strength to strength. And we thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please join us in singing hymn number 195, Showers of Blessing. There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing. Sent from the Savior above, showers of blessings, showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead, there shall be showers of blessings, precious reviving again. Blessing we need. Mercy drops 
round us are falling, but for the showers we plead, there shall be showers of blessing, send them upon us, O Lord, grant to us now a refreshing. Showers of blessing, oh, that today they might fall. Now, as to God, we're confessing. Now, as on Jesus, we call. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing, we need. Mercy drops round us are fall. Have you ever realized when you're in the rainstorm that that's what we're singing about right now? I was hiking once, a two-week backpacking trip. It rained, it downpoured every single day. It was miserable. And we started singing as we were going up and down the rivers that used to be trails. There shall be showers of blessing. Sometimes the blessing comes in the shower, but the shower is what brings the beautiful flowers. Trust in the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you bless every person that is here. May we see the showers of blessing that are all around us, some disguised as thunderstorms, others disguised as rain. But may we realize that in the rain you're bringing a blessing. This week, may we live with the Holy Spirit ever most in our heart. Bless each man, woman, boy, and girl that's here. And may next week, as we come together to worship, we be able to say, hitherto the Lord has brought us, and we are glad. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>